All right. Hi, everyone. We'll uh, go ahead and get started. It is just about time to get going here, so I'll go ahead and get my slides up. Okay, well, first I'd like to uh, thank Endow and the education staff for inviting me to give this webinar today on an introduction to pollinator ID and some other things that visit flowers. My name is Kevin Burles. I am the executive director of Nevada Bugs and Butterflies. We're a local science education nonprofit in Reno. Uh, and I am happy today to talk about pollinator ID partly in support of the INAT Summer uh, Nevada Nature Blitz that we're doing on the iNaturalist web and phone app, uh, identifying the biodiversity in our region. So I'm real excited to be here and give us some, um, maybe a little bit of guidance on what we're looking at when we see things visiting flowers. So we will go ahead and get started and stretch our brains for a minute with a little quiet exercise that we gently like to call, is it a bee? And we'll start off with some easier things and we'll get a little harder as we go through them. So this will be the first one. This was our title image here. You might feel like this is too easy to start off with, but you know, people aren't usually used to pop quizzes at uh, seven in the evening. So we'll go ahead and, and just uh, take a nice long look at that pretty little thing on the flower there. Uh, and then we'll move into some other things and you can ask yourself, is it a bee? And if you think it's easy, then the next question you ask yourself is, why do I know that it's a bee or that it's not a bee? What is it about that animal that makes you think, hmm, that is yes or no? Is that a bee or not a bee? And there's features that you can look at on the whole of the animal. And there's a word for that in taxonomy and in other fields. It's called the gestalt. It's the, it's the general look of a thing. So you've looked at that for a little while and you might think you know. And you might look at this and you'd see some other features. Some features will be the same. Some features will be different. Some of those may all together point to this being a bee or not a bee. Um, but it'll help you understand the variation that's out there as far as different types of flower visiting insects and uh, the variation that makes things different and the variation, the things that aren't variable that bind them together as groups of animals. That's really what we're thinking about today. So this is a, a little bit harder now, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it feels pretty easy. It's certainly one of my favorite flower visiting insects. It's a very pretty animal. Absolutely. It's on a yarrow flower there. Could point out some features you might notice on insects while we look at this and you decide. You can see the antennae and the eyes and there are what we call simple eyes up here. And then these are the compound eyes. Here's a different one. Oh, we can see the eyes and the antennae and the simple eyes there on the top. That's a crazy looking animal, I think. That's a fun one. So again, what makes it a bee or not a bee? Some of these are trickier than others. Here's the next one. There's a lot of, a lot of flying insects that look like this one and I, like to point out that they must be friendly because they have smiley faces painted on their backs. So a lot, a lot of uh, yellow and black flying insects. If you look real close, uh, you'll see that little smiley face. And this is another insect on a yarrow flower. Yarrow, yarrow flowers are native wildflowers. They're a really uh, common pollinator flower out in somewhat wet meadows all throughout the, the Great Basin and into the Sierras. And uh, they attract a lot of different types of, of insects in this region. They're really fun. And yet here's another one. So again, think to yourself, what makes it a bee or not a bee? This is on uh, some sort of mint, it looks like here. I don't know exactly what type of mint. This photo wasn't taken by me, but uh, by a friend who I think has done a lot of work with Endow over the years, actually, Steve Siegel. So is it a bee or not a bee? This is one of the last ones, I believe, if not the last one. Kind of a different shot of it, looking on top of it on a flower. And I do like this view. This is how you would see a lot of flying insects is looking at or in a small flower. 
Okay, so here are our answers. These three are all Bs. So I have two easier ones and one that I definitely was trying to trick you with. So you can look at these three. This one that's trickier is a male B of a, of a type of B that is solitary, which means that each mom takes care of her own young. And so instead of the crazy mating system like honeybees have where males only come out at the end of the season and females are the almost the only ones that you see doing all the work all through the season, a lot of times with native bee species, you're very likely to see a male bee, uh, maybe not quite as likely, but you may very well. And these are male agop agapostum and sweat bees, and the males have this yellow and black striped abdomen. But if you know a little bit about bee biology, you might know that the stinger is only a female trait. So despite the bright, what we call aposomatic coloring, that is actually not something that can sting you at all. That's a male sweat bee there. And then this is a bumblebee and then this is another native apis bee. And we'll go into what kind of makes these bees in a bit. And so these are the things that are not bees. Obviously we have a butterfly here. This is a pygmy blue butterfly. And then we have two things that are wasps. The things that are wasps, if you take a second and guess to it yourself while I'm sitting here talking, the things that are wasps are the bottom right and the top left. And the bottom right is probably just a solitary wasp and there are many things. I'm not enough of a wasp expert to tell you exactly what that is. But the one on the top left is called a jewel wasp or a cuckoo wasp. And we'll talk a little bit about those in the future. But like I said, they are just drop dead gorgeous. And then in the center and in the bottom left, we have two flies. Flies, so those are non-stinging flying insects, right? And they're in a different group of animals than bees and wasps. And we're gonna talk quite a bit about those distinctions. So we'll back up a little bit here. When it comes to pollinators, pollination in specific is, the, is an early part of the process of plant reproduction, but uh, I'll, a lot of times I will even generalize a little bit more and talk about flower visitors. And those are just things that we see on flowers. And so we've talked about a couple of these already in the course of our little exercise. Some of the most important ones are bees because they are collecting the pollen to feed to their young. The pollen is the part of the plant that needs to be transported to another plant to complete that process of, of reproduction. Most of the other groups of insects that you see on this slide are only after the sugar rich liquid nectar in flowers. And so they're not, the generality is that they're not as good at pollinating as bees are, though they may do some of that and most all of them perform other ecological functions as well. Uh, but you can see the wasps and flies, butterflies and moths, Beetles, we will talk a tiny bit about beetles and then I'm not gonna focus much on these because they're outside of my area of expertise, but hummingbirds and bats are very important pollinators, especially in the hot deserts uh, and in the tropics, but they are beautiful animals and they are definitely part of our ecosystem up here in the Great Basin as well. So the goals for today are to, when we think about that group of insects that we talk about as pollinators or flower visitors is to become familiar with some of the important identification parts for flower visitor ID, that is body parts, the things that we look at that tell us what type of animal we're looking at, to learn how to identify some of the major groups of flying insects. So specifically bees, wasps, flies, butterflies, moths, and maybe a little bit more if we feel if we've got time to get into it. And then at the very end, we'll talk about um, where to go for more information which is obviously probably the most important part of anything dealing with insects because there's just too much to get into in any little bit of time. So when we talk about insects, we're talking about a group of invertebrates, things without backbones, and the all true insects, things that are in the, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean true insects, but all things that are true insects have a hard exoskeleton they have three body segments, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen that you can see here. And then uh, six legs or leg places. And I'll, I have, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, when, we, when it comes time. And then antennae or places for antennae. So uh, you can see here in this photo a crab spider eating a male earwig. And one of those things is an insect and one of them is not. 
and the insect is the earwig, and the spider is an arachnid, which is a different group of invertebrates. And one of the distinguishing characteristics of spiders is that they have eight legs rather than six. So that's just an example of how we distinguish those insects at a level that's really easy to understand, I hope. Uh, and this is the place where the wings would go. Um, and I didn't talk about wings as being one of the, the characteristics of all insects because it's a little more variable. But when we look at things that we use to identify different types of insects, there are specific parts that are sometimes surprisingly basic that really distinguish the large groups of animals in, in the different groups of insects. And those spots in particular, uh, are these areas. One of them is at the back end. These appendages are called cerci, like you see here on the earwigs. That's one of the distinguishing characteristics of earwigs are those pincers from the cerci. The legs, the presence of them, the shapes of them, the structures on them are extraordinarily important for identifying different groups of animals, not only distinguishing whether or not we're looking at a butterfly versus a grasshopper, but also what type of butterfly that we're looking at. Uh, the wings, the numbers of sets of wings or the presence of them, not only on individuals, but in a group of individuals. For example, aphids, a common garden pest, have winged individuals and not winged individuals. And then two other areas that are vitally important to distinguishing different groups of insects, and we will talk about some of them today, are the mouth parts, the shape of the mouth parts. For example, uh, do you have biting or chewing mouth parts or do you have sucking mouth parts? And then the antennae, the length of them, the structures that are on them, or whether or not they're very visible at all. All of those are going to be important. Using those body characteristics, we are going to group organisms into different hierarchical levels. And that is the practice of taxonomy. That's the technical side of insect identification. And so when we talk about a particular insect, for example, the monarch butterfly, the group of true insects is the class Insecta. So you may be familiar with these sorts of different hierarchical levels. The class Insecta has all of our insects in it. And the monarch butterfly and all butterflies are in the order Lepidoptera. Below that, and there's lots of little things in between, but below that is the family Nymphalidae. And then the genus and species identifies that particular organism as the monarch butterfly. Order is the level that distinguishes many major groupings. For example, beetles from flies, flies from dragonflies, uh, and so on. Uh, grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids are all in one order. And that is the level that we are going to aim for today, is to help us distinguish what order of insect we are looking at. And then we're going to work down a little bit further than that when it comes to bees and wasps, but not all that much. I typically, in my own personal opinion, like to think that a full undergraduate education in your taxon of interest should get you down to family for everything you see that's in the area you learned about in, and then maybe below that for some of them. And it really takes a graduate level education in, a t in any one taxon to really know the genus and species for uh, even a state, but usually we're talking about learning about North American beetle diversity or North American weevil diversity or that sort of thing, right? That's a, that's a master's or PhD level. So we're really working up here and this is just fine. This is actually going to help us a lot more than we might think. When we think about pitfalls in how we identify animals and getting good at identifying animals, uh, especially insects, there's a few things I like to point out to people. One is you really do need to get it to order in order to identify anything. If you think you are looking at a fly, and in fact you are looking at a bee, your identification efforts are going to be in vain. And that is uh, why we start at this level. That's why we're trying to work at different orders of insects. Because if you can say, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's a grasshopper, then you can flip to the grasshopper section of a field guide and flip through the pictures. But if you are flipping through something else, you know, if you're flipping through uh, the earwig section looking for your Katie did, it's just not going to work. 
quick Google searches. The internet is of course a wonderful place and there are many wonderful insect identification pages. But a lot of times if you Google an insect based on its physical description, because of the way search algorithms work, you will often come up with an invasive animal because that is what is most popular in popular publications like newspapers and blogs and so on. So I see a lot of native beetles, for example, misidentified as Japanese beetle uh, rose, uh, which are big rose pests among other things. And we don't really have those in this area, but we have a lot of other beetles that look very similar to it. So if you put that search description into Google, you've got to be very careful. And then lastly, it's just a reminder that, of course, just like any group of animals, if you want to get really good at birds or you want to get really good at mammals or you want to get really good at insects, it's a, there's a lot out there. And of course, it takes time. So, you know, being forgiving of yourself and, you know, uh, giving yourself resources uh, is going to be the thing you can do to help the most. The thing that's going to make identification toughest in the field, and I just like to point it out, it's maybe a little bit of a, there's no real answer to this, but is mimicry. So mimicry is just when two insects or sorry, two things in general look like each other because it confers some type of advantage, like predator avoidance is one of the main ones. And it's, I would argue, one of the most observable of evolutionary phenomena. We really do, because we're visual creatures, we see when things look like each other. So this evolutionary advantage, like predator avoidance, has two types uh, uh, that come out of it, two types of mimicry. One is Mullerian mimicry, and that's when both species have some sort of way to protect themselves, and they're advertising to others that they have this mode of protecting themselves. And over time, they end up looking like each other because then the thing that they are protecting themselves from only has to look at one search image. So for example, this honeybee is very non-aggressive, but it does have a sting if, it, if it's endangered. And this little tiny wasp also has a very, probably not very painful at all sting, but it does have a sting that it can use to protect itself. And being visual creatures, we notice the contrasting patterns of orange and black or yellow and black. And that contrasting striped pattern, as I'm sure you're aware, is very widespread across stinging insects. And then that's, the, that's to protect them and to protect us, as it were. On the other hand, Batesian mimicry is when you have an unprotected species that's trying to fool a potential predator or some such thing by looking like a well-defended species. So that's where we have a well-defended species like this wasp with its little sting. And then we have this true fly down here and it is not able to sting at all. But many, many types of flies and many flies in very particular groups have evolved to look like wasps and some of them have also evolved to sound like wasps, which I think is particularly cool. So when we go back to our photos, some of our photos from the beginning and we ask ourselves again, is it a bee? And we know that the one on the left is the bee. We might start to notice some differences here and I'll go ahead and highlight those here. So bees, the most noticeable thing when they are out doing it is that they have these pollen collecting hairs on their back legs. So one group of bees has it on their belly, but it's also noticeable there as well. And you'll see that they're collecting pollen on it. But the other features are all in the front. So one of them is that the eyes of a fly nearly fill the entire head. They almost touch on the top. And you might think of that as similar to dragonflies. Uh, whereas bees have some amount of space, and I pointed out those three simple eyes, those are not always visible, but you can see them there. And then their eyes are large, but they do not touch near the top of the head. And then similarly, bees have longer antennae, whereas fly antennae are extraordinarily short, very, very stubby little antennae. So when we think about that fly that you look from the top when you're looking at it on the flower, those little stubby antennae are, are very visible. Uh, as being really short in comparison to the longer antennae of a bee. The other thing that separates out bees from flies, and uh, really one of the easiest ways to set flies apart from other groups of flower visiting insects, 
And lest you have any doubt, flies are a very common group of flower visiting insects in our region. So they are well worth knowing. A lot of the things you might take photos of for our INAT challenge are gonna be flies. Flies are the only insect order with only one set of functional wings. And that's, the, the, that's actually in the name Diptera is two wings as opposed to most other winged insects have four wings. So I have two examples here. And when I put things in parentheses, especially things that end in I-D-A-E, those are the families that these animals are in. So when I was talking about that next level down, right? So we're in the order Diptera, they're in the fam that, that fly is in the family Tachinidae. And that is not anything you have to stick with you, but I have tried to highlight common groups of individuals and things you may actually see out in the wild. And so I hope that the names will be helpful for you to look them up later. So uh, this tachinid fly here has this set of wings and then the other set of wings is uh, not there. And there's a structure that covers it called a calipter. And that calipter is this big white thing there. On the other hand, we have this crane fly, a tapulidae is the family. And crane flies have this one large, enormous set of wings hanging out with their giant legs. And then if you were to look real close, you would see that they have these other two structures here. These structures are called haltiers. So if you see something with haltiers, you know it is a fly. They're the little knobby-like things sitting behind the first set of wings. And in the tachinids and other groups of flies, the haltiers are covered by these calipters. But you still only have one set of wings. So I have a couple slides, flies can be funny. I just want you to get a couple other images of flies so that you can see what makes things a fly. You can get that gestalt uh, into your mind. So you can see this is the one we were looking at earlier, looking on top of it, you can see the large eyes that almost touch at the center and the short stubby antennae. And then from the side here too, it's a little harder to see that the eyes are very large. Uh, you could perhaps overlook that if this was the photo that you had, but the antennae are very, very short. And that is the giveaway that that is a fly. In addition, you could have some support in that there's no pollen collecting hairs on the back legs of this. There will be some exceptions to that with bees, mainly male bees. Uh, but I am just going to say that for the most part, the antennae is where I look first. So these are both flower flies or hover flies in the family Circidae. Just a couple other examples of funny looking flies, just so that you know that there is a lot of variation out there. I'm sure you do, but here's a soldier fly, Stratiomyidae, and you can see short, stubby little antennae, right? Short, stubby little antennae. A bee's antennae would come out to like here. So the short, stubby antennae are the giveaway, even though it is very, very brightly covered. It's got aposomatic coloration and you have no idea if it's got two or four wings because it sits with its wings folded over its back. It's very difficult to see. And then last but not least, the other example I have of a true fly that visits flowers would be male mosquitoes. So this is a photo taken in India. This is not a species I believe that we would have here, but you, it is a, a mosquito and it is a male mosquito and male mosquitoes are nectar feeders, whereas the females are the, are the blood feeders. So uh, just some other examples of flies that you may very well see. You'll look to yourself and you say, boy, that looks like a mosquito on that flower, but mosquitoes suck blood, don't they? Well, the males don't. So they're, they're gonna be nectar feeders. Okay, the next major group that we are definitely gonna spend some time on is Hymenoptera. Hymenoptera is the order that contains bees, wasps, ants, and a group that nobody talks about. And unfortunately, I'm not gonna talk about today either, sawflies. Sawflies are super cool. We do have them around here. They're just not very common and I'm just not gonna talk very much about them today. As opposed to flies, these do have two true sets of wings. And in general, you're probably aware of the things that differentiate bees from other things, mainly the fur and the pollen collecting hairs that we've talked about. And the, the kind of life, the, the biological trait that helps identify bees is that the young consume pollen. And because of that vegetarian diet, a lot of taxonomists call these hippie wasps. Ants, on the other hand, they're less often flower visitors, though they definitely can be. You will find them for sure. 
Uh, and all individuals, some of which will be winged and some of which won't have elbowed antennae. So that kind of kink in the antennae is going to be the giveaway. And believe it or not, within the order Hymenoptera, the whole diversity of ants in the globe is all in one family for Mycidae. So that's kind of what helps us identify things as ants. There's seven families of bees, six of which can be found in the new world. And then everything else, and let me tell you, it is a lot of everything else, are wasps. Those wasps are usually gonna be less furry for the most part, but you will also have not furry bees. And that's where things get really tricky. The biological trait that differentiates many types, all types of wasps from bees is that the young consume meat. So we have some four flying things that you can find on rabbit brush. Some of them will look like bees, some of them will not. You can take a look and decide which ones are bees and which ones are not. I'll take a drink of water here while you take a look. And if you're getting a little bit better, you might notice the tiny little short antennae on that one on the left. That is a different type of fly in the family Bombyliidae, and they're commonly called bee flies. And they do also often mimic bees or wasps in color and in sound. On the other hand, we have a native aphid bee here with its pollen pants going strong. So this is kind of a classic native bee. It's obviously not a honey bee, but it's obviously a bee. It's furrier, uh, the longer antennae, the smaller eyes and the pollen covered back legs, very obvious there. But I just want to point out, there's a whole lot of bee diversity and not all of them look exactly like bees. There are 4,000 species of bees in North America, about 20,000 in the globe. And in Nevada, we have somewhere around 1,000 species. So we have 25% of the continent's bee diversity contained in our state. And some of them I'll point out, you might notice down here are very much yellow and black and not very hairy. There's particular groups of bees that once you know what you're looking at are identifiable. Here's one that's kind of a shiny metallic blue and not very furry at all. And then you have things that are like carpenter bees that are just enormous and so might throw you off just based on their size. So uh, it's important to recognize that. Uh, just a couple things, a couple bees that you will notice and I'll just highlight. Uh, the, like I said, there's six families of bees that you can find in North America. The largest family is Apidae and the ones that are the bet, maybe the most charismatic representatives in our area are bumblebees. And they're all in one genus, Bombus. So, you might think you don't know all that much about insect ID, but by the time you get done with this, you'll be able to identify these bees down to genus. And remember I said that's graduate level education, so we're getting there. So uh, there's 46 species of bumblebees in North America. We have 23 in Nevada. So we have half of the nation's bumblebee diversity contained in our state. They're wonderful animals. They're social, which means they have a queen who stays at the nest and lays eggs and larvae, and you have workers who go out and forage for that. They do make some honey for nurses who stay back at the hive, but they don't make much, uh, just enough for the hive. And then other animals that are other, other bees that are in this same family, Apidae, include another really large uh, uh, specimen. They're, they're called carpenter bees. These can become nuisance pests in old fences or uh, old cabins and sheds because they like half punky wood and they dig it out. They excavate their nests out of that wood. So you'll see little piles of sawdust. They generally don't cause structural damage, but the males especially are territorial. So if they've made their nest or they're guarding a territory uh, that happens to be in the eave above your door, you can get dive bombed by them occasionally. Uh, and then we have other examples. For example, there's squash specialists that we call squash bees. There's sunflower specialists that we call longhorned bees. They're known by these long, long antennae. And then digger bees, which I just point out are kind of distinctive bees of our region. They're big, chunky, black and white, stripy bees. Um, they're just good representatives of Apidae in our region. They often make uh, just fairly undescriptive holes in the desert. And that is why they're called the digger bees. They make little burrows in the ground. So 
Looking back at our rabbit brush photos, then we have our native aphid bee and we had our European honeybee, right? We had our non-native European honeybee. And then the other one that wasn't the fly was a sand wasp. This is in the genus Bembix and it's a wasp, right? So it's a different group of Hymenoptera. It's in a family that's called Crabronidae. And uh, we can look at some of the things that differentiate it from bees here. One specifically, there's no pollen collecting hairs on the back legs. And it is in general less furry, although I think it's obvious that it's not, it's not really much less furry. And there is a little bit of hair going on on the thorax here. So uh, right away, you can see that differentiating bees and wasps in some circumstances is going to be plain old tricky. On the other hand, Sometimes there's easy ones, and that's what we're going to work on today. So commonly seen wasps that you will know as wasps when you see them include on the left the tarantula hawk wasp, which is in the family Pompilidae. Those are spider wasps, and just like its name suggests, that animal feeds on large spiders, particularly tarantulas. Uh, it's very non-aggressive, especially when you see it out foraging in the desert, but if you disturb its nest, and get stung by a female, it has one of the most powerful stings in North America. Uh, so beware. On the right, you have, uh, oh, uh, excuse the uh, typo there, that should say thread wasted wasp. You have a thread wasted wasp in a different family, Sphesidae. And these are very commonly identified by having this red section of the abdomen and then a black section following it and a very, very skinny connection between the thorax and the abdomen. And there are other animals that have this skinny connection, uh, but this red coloration behind it is a little more distinctive in combination. So these are thread-waisted wasps. Many of those are caterpillar specialists. Those are my favorite ones to see in the garden because they're almost always gonna haul away a caterpillar off of one of my garden plants. Other commonly seen wasps, this is a small black and white solitary wasp that's called a potter wasp in the family Vespidae. And there are, let me tell you, lots of fairly small yellow and black striped solitary wasps. The reason that I put these in is not necessarily because you'll be able to know it by the adult, but because you might know it by their nesting behavior. As is suggested, they make sometimes really amazing structures that they put an egg in and then they provision with their larvae, which may be spiders or caterpillars or something else, even aphids or other animals. And sometimes they'll make their nests uh, in between wedged structures. And what happened here was the person removed an outdoor photo frame. They had an outdoor photo and behind it was a nest made by a potter wasp. And each one of these is a cell that it provisions with, with prey items and then it lays an egg and the larvae consume those prey items for their development. This was the one I talked about at the beginning, the jewel wasp or the cuckoo wasp. These are called cuckoo wasps, just like cuckoo birds lay their eggs in other birds' nests. This wasp lays its eggs in other wasp burrows. And so those eggs will hatch before the host egg does. It will kill the host egg and then consume the provision that that wasp has laid. These, partly because they have that kind of sneaky lifestyle, are typically really, really quick. But because they're so bright, they're very noticeable. So when you see something on a flower and it has what feels like a scurrying behavior, like it's, it's rushing around, like it's always got somewhere to go, a lot of times those are going to be the cuckoo wasps. And so this is a good time while we talk about something that's shiny and not very hairy to bring up what I call the shiny things slide, right? So this is a whole bunch of things that if we don't know what they are, are going to look like what they're not. <laughs> and so we have the cuckoo wasp, the jewel wasp, which many people might actually mistake for this, the bottle fly or the blow fly in the family Califoridae. So this again, just as a reminder, is a diptera. It's got only two wings, but the thing that's most noticeable are the, the very large eyes and the very short antennae. And you can see here, especially when you have time to take a photo, this has got much smaller eyes really in proportion and longer antennae. So then comparing these two, this is a bee, this is a mason bee, Megachylidae is the family. Mason bees are uh, the one, are some of the species that you might 
buy a little bee house for, which would be contained of reeds and a small structure that you'd hang up outside somewhere. Uh, this one you can see is furrier, and in general, it's a little bit chunkier, a little bit chunkier. And then uh, these two I point out as just the limits of what introductory knowledge can give you. If you do not know that this is a male sweat bee, I am not, sh there, I'm not sure there's a characteristic not under the microscope that you can look at that will tell you that it is a, in fact a bee and not a wasp. So there really just are limits. The what we call taxonomic diagnostic trait, the thing that definitely identifies it as a bee is actually a patch of hair on the thorax and you can't see it without a dissecting scope. So I just want to let you know that there will always be limits. There's limits for what I can tell you too. Okay. Moving on from some of those tricky and smaller and fast flying things, we'll talk about butterflies and moths for a minute. So we'll take a step back, we'll take a breath, and we'll ask ourselves in these four photos, which ones are butterflies and which ones are moths? Take a second and think to yourself. All right, so when we look at these, there are some dark ones, there are some bright ones, they're all out flying in the day because we have daytime photos of them. So it can be a little tricky with some of the general characteristics that we often use to identify butterflies or moths, like that butterflies are furrier, or sorry, excuse me, moths are generally furrier, butterflies are a little less furry, or that moths are generally out at night and butterflies are out during the day. Uh, that butterflies are bright colored and that moths are generally drab. These things not only have exceptions where we live, but they uh, all fall apart in the tropics. In the tropics where it's dark in the understory all day long um, and that the daylight cycle is the same all year long, a lot of those characteristics tend to have a lot of exceptions. So the trait that defines butterflies from moths within the, the order Lepidoptera are the antennae. Like I mentioned before, what's on the antennae can be very, very important. All butterflies, things that we call butterflies, all have clubs at the end of their antennae. They have little thickened ends that look like clubs, whereas moths will either have totally simple antennae, or the example that we don't have here is the males oftentimes have feathered antennae, and the feathering on the antennae is used to pick up pheromones from the females. Pheromones are uh, airborne chemicals that they use to communicate with each other, let them know where they are. So the males will often have those feathered antennae, but these two are butterflies. This is a wood nymph. This is a type of dusky winged skipper. This is a white-lined sphinx moth. And then this is a, a member of the tiger moth family. So again, I'm going to try and suggest that you have more identification skills than you might think. So uh, everything that I am going to show you, there are many butterflies that look like it, but there are some things that are the most common. For example, we have several white butterflies in our region, but the most common one that you will see in urban areas by far is going to be the cabbage white butterfly. It's attracted to plants in the cabbage family to lay its eggs on for its caterpillars. And because we have those in almost every backyard garden, it's, all, it's ubiquitous in urban areas. And it has been brought around to most of the globe with our human activity. It is an extraordinarily plain butterfly with a creamy white underside and a brighter white upper side with either one or two dots on the forewing. So females have two, males have one, but those will be the only markings. Every other white butterfly, which will be less common, though not entirely absent from urban areas, will have more coloring on the underside. I'll have some green or some yellow or some orange on the wingtips that's very bright and pretty on one that we call an orange tip butterfly in the spring. This does not have any of that, and because it's so common in urban areas, it's easy to identify. The monarch is one that's easy to identify just because it's so big and so showy and so popular in popular science things. And it's popular, unfortunately, because its populations have been declining fairly drastically over the last several decades. Uh, there are a couple butterflies that it can be confused with. 
uh, specifically the queen or the viceroy. So there's kind of a, a naming collaboration there, right? You have the monarch, the queen, and the viceroy. Uh, the queen feeds on milkweed just like the monarch does, and the viceroy does not. So you sometimes see them in different areas. Uh, they're strong flyers. They've got that bright orange and black coloration with the orange spots along the mar uh, sorry, orange, the, the white spots and a black margin along the edge there. So another one that you would probably recognize on site. Another one that people recognize, although admittedly they do get it confused with monarchs just based on the size, are a group of four different species in our area. There are others in the Eastern US and in other regions and some on mountaintops. But in our area, the four most common things that you'll see that are big and bright and, and yellow and black are swallowtails. And these, as the name denotes, have these tails on the edge. Some are shorter than others. It can be a little difficult to, to see them sometimes. And they often get torn off by birds during narrow escapes and things like that. So it can be tricky to make sure that's what you've got. But when they're in good shape, they're beautiful and they've got these tails. So the two-tailed swallowtail is the largest butterfly in our region and it has a larger tail on the outside, a smaller one on the inside. But if you see something that's yellow and black, you could pretty much guarantee yourself that that's a type of swallowtail. And those are all in one genus, Papilio. So you've gotten pretty far with that. There's one slight exception. The pale swallowtail looks pretty much black and white, but nothing has that striping on the upper side except those swallowtails. Another common one that people see is the painted lady. If you've ever raised butterflies in a class, this is the painted lady. It sometimes gets mistaken for the monarch because it is orange and black, but you can see that the patterning is very different with most of the orange hanging out in the center of this butterfly here. These uh, are very strong flyers and sometimes they're found in large numbers in the spring. So sometimes people will see five or 10 or 15 of these uh, right in their area, all on the same day, and that's because they're migrating north in the spring. The last things I want to point out for butterflies and moths are little things in the yard. Should you happen to take a photo of a little tiny orange thing in the yard and you say to yourself, boy, that looks like a moth, I'll remind you to look at the antennae. And if you see these clubbed antennae, these are generally what we call golden skippers. They're small orange butterflies in a family Hesperiidae, and they eat grass as caterpillars. And because of that, they can often be found in urban areas like yards and parks. So this is another one where if you're just out doing your INAP program in your yard, you're very likely to see something small and orange. See if you can find those uh, clubs on the antennae after you take the photo that will help you identify it as a butterfly and not a moth. And similarly, another animal that often gets mistaken for a moth because of its coloration is the common checkered skipper. It eats one of the plants that it eats is Malva neglecta, which is a common weed in the less watered parts of yards in our area. And it is very, very common in our area in urban regions. And uh, you can see it's got this kind of, it's very pretty close up black and white coloration with blue, some blue tinges in the center on the body. And again, if you took a photo, you could notice the antennae that are clubbed. And that would clue you in that this is a butterfly and not a moth. You can see here, it may sit with its wings open and it may sit with its wings closed. That's very tricky, right? Because that's one of the other generalities is that moths tend to sit with their wings closed and butterflies with their wings open. But there are definite exceptions. A few day flying moths or moths that you see in the daytime uh, I would include in this family Sphingidae or Sphinx moths. So they're still in that group Lepidoptera, but they're in different families. And these uh, families tend to be called Sphinx moths or Hawk moths. Uh, sometimes they're called hummingbird moths because they hover in front of the flowers. Uh, one, one that I'll point out, there are, there's a, a, one that's commonly a pest animal, and that's the five-spotted hawk moth whose caterpillar is often called the tomato hornworm and is a pest of tomatoes, as you might imagine. If you've ever gardened, it's, it's very common. On the other hand, people often misidentify this uh, or misidentify white-lined sphinx moths as five-spotted hawk moths just because they're more familiar with the five-spotted hawk moth because of the tomato plants. But there are a lot, a, a lot of native sphinx moths. And so this is by far the most common few years ago, they had big numbers in the springtime. 
uh, and you'll see them nectaring on a variety of different types of flowers, hovering in front of them, flying very quickly. And then last but not least, I want to cover a few things that don't have wings or that you don't see the wings uh, that are very common flower visitors. And I want to start with one that you're probably familiar with in one stage or another, and those are ladybugs. So these are beetles. That's the order Coleoptera, and ladybugs are all in the family Coccinellidae. And this is the adult, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. And in this case, the animal does have wings and its wings are hidden under a hard set of wings. It has two soft flying wings and two hard wing covers that are called elytra. And that's what has the polka dot pattern. This is a ladybug larva. Some people are familiar with it, some are not. It looks like a stubby caterpillar and that's because ladybugs and all beetles go through complete metamorphosis, just like butterflies. So this larval life stage who instead of eating plants is gonna munch down on aphids, often has some sort of orange coloration on the abdomen, has six legs and generally looks like that stubby caterpillar. So that's what you may see. You may see a lot of these hanging out on plants that have aphids, uh, even on the flowers, right? So that's why you might notice that. And then other things, as soon as you look at a flower, when you look at the rest of the plant, you will start to see other things on that plant. And so I just wanna point out, there are a lot of larval things, just like this larval ladybug. There are other larval things crawling around on plants that you might notice. Uh, two we have here, one is the caterpillar. So that is a larval lepidopteran. This is the tomato hornworm caterpillar that turns into that moth. So again, it's in that same family, Sphingidae. On the right here, we have a fly larva. So flies also have complete metamorphosis and they have these larvae that, uh, that eat aphids. It's munching down on an oleander aphid here, which might be on a milkweed plant. And you can see some things that differentiate these larvae uh, even from each other. So whereas this has several things that are called pro legs on the back, it has six little true legs up front and a visible Head. So the head is tucked away in this photo, but you can see it, it's there. It's this section there in the very front. Fly larvae have no visible head. It's there, but you can't see it. Um, it's there in most of them, but you can't see it. On the other hand, beetle larvae have no structures on the back that we call pro legs. They have only the six true legs up front. So right away, we can start to differentiate beetle larvae with no pro legs, caterpillar larvae with pro legs in the back, and syrphid fly larvae really with no visible legs and not much of a head to speak of either. Okay, as we wind up here, I'll leave you with some identification guides. So for general insect ID, there, is, uh, there are two decent guides that I like. One is the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America. Uh, and the other is the National Wildlife Federation Field Guide to Insects and Spiders of North America. And I often recommend two references for anything that you're doing, one with illustrations and one with photos because they just, for obvious reasons, they are very complementary, especially when it comes to figuring out diagnostic traits. Uh, and so the Kaufman Guide has illustrations and the Federation Field Guide has photos. Specifically for bees, uh, there's bees are a little more difficult to get a good field guide for. There is, I didn't list it here, a field guide to the common bees of California. That would be a third one I would list. But even it has some shortcomings. Uh, but the books that will help you get a handle on it are these. And the best one is The Bees in Your Backyard by Joseph Wilson and Olivia Messenger Carroll. Uh, it's useful just as a coffee table book. It's a beautiful book. Uh, and then Bee Basics, an introduction to our native bees, I often recommend because it's available for free online. And it is a production of the U.S. Forest Service and the Pollinator Partnership Organization. And that's the website where that can be found. And then for butterfly identification, because butterflies are out during the day and very charismatic for the most part, a lot of people want to identify them. So again, I have one uh, field guide with illustrations, which is the Kaufman Field Guide to Butterflies of North America. And then for photos, the Swift Guide to Butterflies of North America by Jeffrey Glassberg. And Cynthia, my wife and I both do butterfly survey work during the summer. And both of these books are in our backpack day in and day out. So those are the books we use. 
All right, so I'll just leave you with a few quick take home messages. One is that there are a diversity of insects that visit flowers. And the second is that many of these do look alike. So it can be helpful to be very zen about your insect identification efforts and to take your time and to make sure that you work on the fundamentals first, just like in any talent that you might choose to grow. Uh, but in the meantime, there are some ways to identify different groups of animals. And so I've just listed these here for fun. We think about the eyes and antennae when we think about flies versus bees. I think I nailed that one to the ground pretty well. We talk about pollen collection and how furry the body seems with wasps versus bees. And then with butterflies versus moths, we really only have to worry about the clubs on the antennae to distinguish things as butterflies. And then the last thing I want to suggest is if you haven't uh, taken part in our Nevada Summer Nature Blitz. We have a pollinator challenge that'll be starting next week, which means that the person who uh, posts the most pollinator flower visitor photos on INAD in our program gets strong kudos and maybe small prizes that we wrangle up over time. So uh, we're very excited to have that going through the whole summer with the pollinator challenge starting next week. So with that, I will leave you with one more pretty picture of something that's very obviously a bee on a flower. And I'll say thanks again to the Endow crew. And uh, I think I have a few minutes if there are any questions. I will go ahead and close my screen share. And see if there's any questions. I don't see any questions. So if there's nothing else, I think I will uh, stop recording the webinar here. I want to thank everybody for listening today. And uh, hopefully everybody has a wonderful summertime. Avoid the heat in the, hot of, in the uh, high part of the day here and have a wonderful summer and take a look at some flowers and find some good bugs for us. So thanks very much. Have a uh, wonderful rest of your night.